Welcome to Taking the Higher Road, the Driver Reach and Freight Waves production. I'm your host, Jeremy Raymer, founder and CEO of Driver Reach, a modern recruiting and compliance software solution. On this show, I interview industry experts and thought leaders who bring their insights to the driver lifecycle as we discuss the industry's greatest challenges, driver recruiting and retention. I appreciate all the positive feedback on the show. Please remember to rate review Taking the Higher Road, whatever platform you use to listen. This week, I'm thrilled to be joined by a great industry friend, leader, partner, Grady Phillips, Senior Director of Strategic Accounts at Workforce QA, and former president of Corporate Medical Services, who was recently acquired by Workforce QA. Uh, glad to finally have you on the show, Grady. Great to see you. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to see you, too. Well, you've got, uh, what, over 20 years of experience in the industry. You're, you're a leader and speaker known for your expertise on drug and alcohol testing, DOT physicals, sleep apnea. Uh, I'm excited to dive into that world uh, with you to learn about your background, the, the transition from CMS to Workforce QA. I want to be able to share with our listeners, you know, exactly who Workforce QA is and how you're able to better facilitate the, the qualification and hiring uh, process of drivers. And then uh, I also hope we can discuss whether or not, you know, we can expect any changes in the world of drug testing, such as, you know, allowing hair follicle testing uh, to be an acceptable form of collection. Uh, and then lastly, we'll answer a question from one of our listeners during our Deeper Dive segment. Does that all work for you? Oh, yeah. Sounds great. Let's get started. So, well, before we dive in, as is the custom, I often ask if there are any book recommendations that uh, you might have for the audience or perhaps some other, you know, medium or resource. You know, where do you find inspiration to grow your your skills or your knowledge? Well, I, you know... Between uh, different podcasts, different just random things that we see in the ATA, the freight waves, the the transport topics, uh, trying to get a little bit of enrichment just from online libraries where I can rent books, uh, they do set a di- deadline. So uh, I recently listened to uh, about 90% of Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, which was an FBI. You've probably read that one. Love that book. It was great. And then I always try to mix in a little bit of personal uh education at the same time so i recently checked out the book jaws but i did not get a chance to read it before it was your turn so that's next on my list well that's funny that you say never split the difference um one of the things i was at a i was at an event and somebody was saying how they were in a negotiation talking about a rate a price for something and they they said the number like seven thousand six hundred and forty eight dollars and seventy two cents and they said, any idea why I was that specific? And I said, Chris Voss never split the difference. And he was like, yes, how did you know? You know, he, so one of these rare instances where it must be, it must be accurate if, uh, if they're that specific. It, they've got it down to the penny. Uh, right. Never, never compromises the, the idea. Goes. But it's a great book. And I'm glad you, you're actually at least the second, maybe even the third uh, interview who has recommended that book. So. For those of you who are listening who haven't read it yet, it you'll really like it. Not only is it great for just conversations, but it's a really neat story. Is this guy is an FBI hostage negotiator, and he has gone all over the world, um, you know, dealing with that situation. So really cool. Highly would recommend it. And Chris, if you're listening, feel free to you know some <laughs> some kickbacks here. Um, so let's chat a little bit about you. Your you know kind of your background, how you got started. In the industry, my father started corporate medical services, known as CMS, back in 1995. Uh, I was intermittently involved uh, with him uh, doing that work, and as the business grew uh, for the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, meanwhile, I was also pursuing an engineering company that uh, I owned and operated for several years. But about 12 years ago, I sold it and joined him full time here at Corporate Medical Services, where we have really enjoyed uh, serving drug and alcohol physicals, any type of occupational testing need uh, for drivers and employees across the country. Now, we operate in a highly regulated industry, right? Um, you know, recruiting qualifying drivers is very complex. Um, at its core is compliance. We can't properly you know, hire drivers without compliance being a fundamental part of that process. And uh, so I love talking about this facet of recruiting because this is in my opinion, the, the greatest area of opportunity for educating the audience. Um, so from that perspective, what was, what was you know, corporate medical services and, and how has your expertise as you became president of that operation, how, how has that expertise transitioned over to, uh, to Workforce QA? Well, Workforce QA was started uh, a few years after CMS, but Workforce QA has a history of maybe an amalgamated 
a group of other companies. And so they have grown by acquisition over the years. I think we're the fifth and certainly not the last acquisition of that group. So what we found is that they have uh, been very open to learning from things that CMS may have done or done well. Uh, and at the same time, they do a lot of things extremely well. So it's virtually a larger scale operation of the same thing that we've done for CMS for many years. Uh, and we've we've met a lot of great people that have come from a very diverse experience all across the country. So we now have employees in 17 states. Uh, but, you know, specifically to what I've done with our clients, uh, just have a, a wider resource network of people that have done the work. Uh, you know, we've we now have uh, really good experts on the team, people that have, have been around and done a lot of drug and alcohol testing over the years. So it's been been a really great experience. So I want to talk about Workforce QA here in a second, but I also, uh, I think it's important to know uh, when a company is growing and if their growth strategy is around acquisition, you, you hit it on the head. To be really successful, I think that being open-minded to look at how can we, are there opportunities to improve the way we do things? We might do things really good and, and believe that, but as you get really close with others and you, you know, sort of trying to bring them in, anytime we can uh, learn from other best practices and incorporate that, I think that's just, that's not just a good strategy from a business growth acquisition standpoint. I think that's good for us. That's good for listeners. Hopefully, even in this conversation, as we talk about some of the things that Workforce QA does, are there opportunities for them to improve how they are managing the the qualification, the hiring, and in maintenance, you know, um, of their driver, you know, process? So, I, I know you you talked about drug and alcohol testing. Maybe this is an opportunity to to I talk about Workforce QA a little bit, and 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 what else do you do beyond that, and and how are you helping carriers, you know, more efficiently manage the, the the complex landscape of properly qualifying drivers. Sure. Well, you know, specifically and and, and the the biggest hindrance a lot of times to activating a driver is just that drug test. And while I think at our latest numbers between 80 85 percent of results are coming back in 24 hours, there are some that take a little bit longer. And there are a lot of medical clinics across the country who have had serious turnover, serious loss of expertise, serious uh process uh, breakdowns from lack of knowledge of how to uh, deal with the landscape and things that are changing. And so that's what CMS did. And then we were in a great position of being acquired. We outgrew being a family business. And so we just kept growing and, and we were in a great position to evaluate different TPAs. And so looking into a, a, a company that had the same culture as us was critical. Uh, be, being cl customer focused, being client focused, being able to reach out and try to address those problems as they happen as quickly as possible because at the end of the day, it's about getting the driver in that seat faster and earning money for the company, for the driver. And so, you know, speed and accuracy are the name of the game. And that's that's really where we try to focus our energies on that part. Now, you have other things that, you know, driver compliance. You've got the DOT physicals. You have the, the sleep apnea, which will never go away. Maybe one of these days it'll be regulated, but it is a, it is a problem that does affect thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of drivers out there. And so we we offer sleep apnea program to assist our clients in that regard. Uh, DOT physical management, uh, we do with uh, driver qualification, uh, files training, that type of thing. Workforce Degree offers all of that. And it has a great partnership with Driver Reach at the same time. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. Just anytime you can uh, leverage technology and then and, and be as efficient as possible, everyone wins. The driver wins from an efficiency, a, a good experience, and get them, you know, through the process quickly and, and get them, you know, qualified and driving for you. But at the same time, um, the less tedium, and again, like I said, highly regulated industry, there's a lot of boxes to check and, and hoops to jump through. The, the more that we can uh, uh, make things as efficient as possible for for the end user, the better. So let's, let's kind of geek out a little bit. I, I love to talk about uh, compliance and uh, let's talk past and present and, and how... How drug and alcohol testing, how has it evolved over the years? Oh, how long do we have? Because <laughs> I, 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 I'd like to do the same exercise for, for the audience here. I'd like to do it for, for drug and alcohol testing as well as for uh, DOT physicals because both have had some changes over the years. And my yeah. this is year 20 for me, and I've noticed and seen uh, some changes. So, yeah, maybe the high notes of uh, drug and alcohol testing. Sure. Well, uh, you know, let, let's uh, outline it just a little bit. So drug and alcohol or drug testing specifically has three different parts. You have the collector, the laboratory, and the MRO, right? And it, all of that at the end of the day 
gets reported back to the client. So the, the biggest change that's happened in the last several years, and it's continuing to grow but not there yet, is the electronic chain of custody. And what that does is it allows clients to order testing really at, currently at about 4,000 locations across the country where they can uh, order a drug test and you never run out of chain of custodies. The problem with that is that once that collection gets to the laboratory, it's still a paper process. And so the translation of that electronic to paper is still an issue. It still causes some delays. Uh, anybody who has dealt with this problem will recognize the words wet signature issue, uh, where a, a clinic a collector has to sign in ink the chain of custody. Uh, we are working to address that. You know, our CEO is actively trying to realize that this is not something that should always be required and try to try to go from the top down to try to enhance that product so that we don't have those delays that pop up so that we can be a paperless process from beginning to end. Uh, you know, the newer things in drug and alcohol are, there's, there's two different things that we're addressing. One is, you mentioned earlier, the hair testing. There's also oral testing, you know, different types of specimens that we are trying to push forward. And then which drugs need to be tested. Most people don't realize that uh, DOT tests don't currently cover fentanyl. And that really shocks a lot of people. Uh, we're hopeful that that will change very quickly. You know, there are some, uh, we really, uh, it's always been called a five-panel test. Uh, opiates, morphine and codeine were the basic five-panel that were tested for years. Uh, they added a few painkillers back in 2018. Uh, they've uh, enhanced the amphetamine panel a little bit before that, but they have not yet uh, added fentanyl. So we're, we're very hopeful that that will be on the list very soon few other drugs also that uh, should be out there, perhaps uh, methadone and benzodiazepines are also not tested for. And we, we think that there are some real risk factors out there for drivers. Yeah. And, and the clearinghouse, yeah. obviously, uh, you know, it, it, over the last few years, has certainly uh, closed the loophole. I, re I recall when I first got into the industry and we would always, re when we had, when a driver left or if they failed a drug test, we would report that to DAC back then, you know, at the time. That was the only, you know, repository of information like that. And I had this conversation with somebody. This was about 2006 or so. I was having a conversation with somebody and I was saying how um, they hired. I found out that they hired a driver that had failed a drug test for us. And I said, didn't you check, you know, DAC? And he says, no, I, we don't do that. And and my, the concept of a database way back then was a really big deal, you know, to me. And I was a champion for it. So, you know. Sadly, it took, you know, 14 years later to get that. It was a pretty much unanimous, you know, uh, thing that everybody wanted. And it still took, you know, speed of government. But that's obviously, I, I think, uh, revealed, you know, now that we have three plus years of data now, uh, the number of drivers that have been removed from the industry is pretty significant. We're in uh, six, six figures now and uh, types of drugs that are used. But even to your point, it's, I did not know that about fentanyl. So that's... Uh, I, Probably a lot in this audience are learning that. So, so maybe let's talk about the future. What can we expect down the road? Do you think is hair follicle testing something? There are companies doing it today. Uh, in addition to your analysis, and that's just a huge expense. They do it probably for purposes of you know safety, and you know. But at the same time, uh, it's coming at an exorbitant expense. Do you think that's going to change? No, hair testing, I don't see it being added uh, in the next few years, perhaps the next several years. It would require a complete overhaul of the proposed regulation, and there's no indication that that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, people that, you know, read that proposed regulation, hair testing, uh, one of my peers called it a dumpster fire of a regulation. Uh, the way that I said it is whoever wrote that regulation was mad at hair testing. Uh, it required uh, many, many things, uh, one of which was when you did a hair test, you had to simultaneously do a secondary test so that if the hair test came back positive and the driver denied that he had actually or she had actually used cocaine, that you had a second specimen that would confirm it. Well, the whole issue with hair testing is it has a much bigger window of detection and picks up a lot more results than other forms of testing. So if you do a hair test, but you're limited by the, the lower window of detection specimen, what's the point? And so you're right, carriers, uh, particularly larger carriers, do a, a non-DOT hair test, maybe a a company policy hair test at the same time that they do the, the DOT. And I look for that trend to continue for a long period of time. So that's that's where we are. That I, I see a lot more prospect with oral fluid testing. And when you look at the numbers, the positivity numbers, uh, particularly Quest releases a, a, a what they call a DTI every year, the positivity rate of oral testing is surprisingly high, surprisingly close to air testing. And a big reason for that is because all tests are observed. 
uh, urine testing people, you know, in the industry, the, the, the inside jokes that we use are people that get to study for their urine tests. Uh, in other words, uh, I'll say this, uh, the, the synthetic urine business is at an all time high. It's well over a billion dollar industry and drivers are easily in, you know, a lot of this, it, it let's really geek out and talk about our history, right? The, 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 <laughs> the drug and alcohol, uh, regulations were written some time ago. And when they were written, they realized that when people are asked to provide a, a body fluid, body tissue sample, it falls underneath the Fourth Amendment. So it is a voluntary search and seizure. And so when they did that, they were copying military regulations. Uh, military, everything is observed. You do a urine test, it's, it's going, somebody's going to watch the urine leave your body. But in civilian world, they could not require people to do that. And so people are afforded a right to privacy. Well, a lot of people take advantage of that right to privacy and produce a sample that's not their own. So we see a, a huge number of samples that are uh, not caught at the collection status. And here's another thing most people probably do not realize is that synthetic urine will pass laboratories. Laboratories do not catch synthetic urine. So it's 100% at the collector uh, state to be looking for that situation. Yeah, and I don't, well, that's, in, first of all, incredible knowledge and, and, and background. I appreciate that. The, the the synthetic urine being a billion dollar industry is, it's a sad, that's a sad testament right there. Um, we can be better. If we can apply sort of maybe that same, you know, past, present, future to, to physicals, to DOT physicals, let's, let's talk about the past and present. You know, how, how has uh, DOT physical process evolved over the years? Well, there's a lot of regulations uh, that are out there. They they keep getting delayed, um, you know, over the last several years. But the DOT physical substantively changed back in 2016, I believe it was, when they changed the format. And it, the idea was that uh, medical examiners would upload not the full history because they don't upload personal information to the government, but they would upload uh, basically tied to a CDL uh, the certification length of the physical. Well, medical examiners still do that, and they they – most of them have to do it within it. Well, they do it within a 24 hour period. Uh, I don't know how tightly that's regulated or enforced, but the, the second part of that always was expected to be that the FMCSA would take that information and provide it to the uh, local DMV, the state DMVs. That part has never been successfully implemented. Uh, we look for it to happen at some point in the future, but when that happens, we will have a lot tighter control on drivers who are disqualified for medical conditions than we currently do. Uh, currently, if a examiner disqualifies a person, uh, that company typically will stop their employment. Perhaps uh, if, if they feel that the examiner made a, a bad decision, they can send them to a second one. But you have to be very careful about that, of course. Uh, but, you know, what we're looking for is to be able to disqualify drivers for the long term when they are not uh, in a position to operate, you know, a commercial motor vehicle on America's public highways next to all of our families. This is where, you know, heavy, heavy equipment traveling at fast speeds. Uh, really does require that regulation to be in a public place. Now, what's the, uh, I know the, was it in 2016? Is that when the National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners, was that became a thing? It was about in the same time frame. I don't remember exactly when the, the you know, national certification, but it was it was roughly that same time period. And so every, every physical does currently uh, have to be done by a certified medical examiner, and it's the responsibility of the carrier to ensure that the certification number is that of a matching person. Now, there's still ways around that. If a, in, uh, an industrious uh, driver is trying to uh, present a fraudulent uh, medical card and a carrier may not be aware of it, but it did help, certainly help reduce uh, any non-certified examiners. Yeah, and I think, well, that added a step and a, and, a, and a box to check in the driver qualification file is now there has to also be a note that references, you know, that an employer note sort of verifying the medical examiner um, on the physical is listed on the registry. And that's just, that's an added step. You know, any, I mean, and I, I understand the concept and I think all of that is, it's all good. It's all for the purpose of safety and compliance. Just any opportunities for efficiency that you can see uh, in the, in the uh, process of DOT physicals going forward. Well, that, that particular step is something we provide to our clients of providing that note. When we pay for a physical, we're going to make sure it was done by a certified examiner. So that, that small step hopefully is not too big of a, a hurdle for, for any particular carrier. But you're right, it, it does take time. It is one extra thing. Um, you know, what else can be done with DOT physicals going forward? 
Uh, the same as, as chain of custody. You know, there are electronic uh, physicals that are out there and have been out there for a long period of time. Uh, you know, we don't see a lot of consistency. There are several different producers, different medical examiners use different products. They all get to the same place. They all get to a certificate certificate of a valid driver or disqualified driver. So, you know, what, what could be done to speed up that process? You know, some processes really should take a little bit of time of a driver going in and really being evaluated for their condition. It's not something that you can easily do remotely. You know, you're, you, you need to sit in front of somebody. And one thing is that, you know, a medical examiner in the right mindset is acting as an examiner. They may very well be a doctor. They may very well be a nurse or somebody that on a day-to-day -day looks for people's health conditions and expects those people to try to help solve their own conditions. But as an examiner, sometimes you're presented with drivers who are trying to obscure things and are trying to get past because, you know, to, to their credit, they're trying to earn a living and trying to get out there and work. But, you know, sometimes people need to get more health treatment before they can be certified to operate a commercial motor vehicle. So my thought is that on that, we should continue to have face-to-face, -face, continue to have those. Uh, but once that's done, you know, the once the government upload is, is completed, it should be a fairly quick process. Yeah, I know sometimes, you know, companies are challenged with they run an MVR, they don't see that it's the updated DOT physical is added there yet. So they have to wait and they run it again. And those maybe those little types of opportunities to to improve that process, I think, might exist. But I agree 100 percent. I mean, that's a it's a vetting process and it's there for a reason. Um, we've got just uh, time for our last question here, which is our deeper dive question. And this one actually, uh, interestingly, has to touch on sleep apnea, which uh, I, I know is an area of expertise for you as well. And the, the, the question is, 10 to 15 years ago, sleep apnea was all I read about. It seems like I hear almost nothing about it anymore, yet it's just as prevalent today or more than it was back then. Has anything changed? It, it, you are correct that roughly 2012 to 2017, it seemed to get hotter and hotter and hotter every year. In 2017, through a, a, a long discussion of how this occurred, it got to Congress. Well, at that moment, President Trump was taking office and decided that we were in a deregulatory environment and declined to uh, set rules. And that really was the, uh, the temporary death knell for regulations on sleep apnea. Sleep apnea has always been around and will always be around. Uh, I use the, the analogy to people with sleep apnea that it's a lot like eyeglasses or contact lenses, that nobody has perfect sleep. Everyone has a minor amount of sleep apnea, and some people need treatment so badly that it's, you know, when, when I got glasses when I was a kid, I didn't realize trees had leaves. And so they made an instant difference to me. And, and sleep apnea, we hear that a lot. And unfortunately, you have a lot of people in the middle who, you know, they need treatment, but they don't want to wear their glasses because it's not that bad. Same thing with sleep apnea. And those are the unfortunate ones that, you know, you just have to be able to, to measure that. Um, you know, the problem with sleep apnea is with medical examiners, uh, that know which side of their bread is buttered on. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, sleep, uh, an examiner wouldn't make the right decision, but you don't want to be known as the examiner that sends everybody for a sleep apnea test. And so we, we are asking examiners to use best practices, but it's a situation where it's really unfair of them to do so. We really need to give them some basic rules of who should be tested and, you know, what, what compliance is required for sleep apnea. So I, I would like to see some additional regulation on that. Uh, it just seems like our government's very busy trying to do other things, and this is not something that's risen to the occasion. Hopefully, we won't see another tremendous crash or loss of life uh, that brought it on the last time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree, and thank you for your insight there. And, and, and Grady, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm grateful for our partnership, uh, your expertise, your passion for the industry. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeremy. It's good to talk to you. And thanks for joining me for another episode of Taking the High Road and for spreading the word to your industry peers. We really appreciate it. Uh, remember, you could submit any questions or comments, including those which may appear on upcoming Deeper Dive segments at podcast at driverreach.com. And don't forget to rate and review Taking the Higher Road, whatever platform you use to listen. Until next time, thank you for taking the higher road.